Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're gonna do a painting of garlic, and I did this kind of sketch in a toned gray uh, sketchbook just because I was curious about how I would paint this all kind of kind of like all white subject. Here it is, a, a bulb of garlic um, on gray, so that way I could have that extra you know place to pull up the highlights. And I thought that was kind of cool, um, but I also wanted to paint it on just regular watercolor paper. So that's what we're going to do today. I've got um, a palette here that has some Paul Rubens Primatech paints in it, and I've got my little swatch of the of the Primatech paints. And the reason I wanted to use them is because they're kind of neutralized, they're not super vibrant, and I thought they'd be really good for this subject, being that um, it would, you know, kind of give me a little texture and a little bit of earthiness, and I just thought it would it'd work really well. Um, I'm going to start off by sketching with an Albright Drawer watercolor pencil in brown. You could use um, yellow ochre would be another good color, raw sienna, uh, something light like that, and I'm going to actually, you know what, I'll hold up this bottle of garlic as I'm doing it. Um, and then I'll set it back down off to the side so I can so I can look at it. Basically, you've got kind of like a Hershey Kiss shape is the overall shape of the garlic. I'm just drawing it really light because um, I don't want to have a bunch of extra pigment here. And then you're going to have like pieces coming off of it, and then you're going to have some like bits of skin coming around. I love to draw garlic. Um, Sometimes when you're like cooking, you'll notice that you just got some scrap and it will look really good. It'll look really interesting. And this is one of my quarantine still life. <laughs> I think, you know, finding stuff that you can be inspired by while you're around your house, you're stuck at home, is just a really good, a uh, really good habit to be in. So you got these parts here where the, I've already broken off some cloves of garlic that I used. I made pesto the other night. Um, and it turned out really well. Used I use always use more garlic than than uh, well I don't follow a recipe but um, I tend to use way more garlic than than you know most I don't know if most people but than like recipes call for but I just really like it I think it's really good for you too. Uh, so up here we've got this I know we can see this part of a clove. We've got this big kind of like mound area with some. You can kind of see the. Uh, contours of the cloves beneath the sheath of skin and then we can see this little clove back there and it's okay like when you're when you're sketching to get you know to move things around and you know almost make an idealized picture obviously not for like a botanical if you're doing something like something scientific or botanical but when you're just you're drawing to um, you know, to make a picture that you want to look at, something that you want to like the looks of, you know, you can embellish a little bit, I guess is what I'm saying. It's up to you. I mean, if you're doing like, um, like true botanical artwork, you'd probably want to just, you know, draw what's there, but, um, I like to embellish sometimes. That's why I wanted to do this piece, because I wanted to, uh, kind of take this all white object and really just kind of um, push the color. Now right here we got these three layers of skin. I thought that was really pretty. I just really love the look out of it. It's almost like ruffles on a dress. So I really wanted to get that in there. And then we got this ruffle in there. Just kind of flap the skin. I like to turn my pencil as I go. I find that it just gives me those really nice organic shapes. Hopefully that's showing up. I know it's going to be difficult. I'm not pressing really hard because I don't want to, I don't want to end up with, can you see that? I'm going to get this like kind of wing in there. I like these kind of billowy. It's, it is kind of like you're drawing fashion. I bet like a lot of fashion is inspired by like flowers and fruit. and vegetables and things like that. I mean, it's gotta be inspired by something, right? All right, I'm gonna set this down on my white piece of paper. I'll try and remember to snap a photo of it so that I can put that on my blog when I share this tutorial. So now I'm just gonna go in. I will darken a few of the lines. I wouldn't if it was just for me painting this, but I am gonna darken some of these lines for your benefit. Got this kind of like curl of skin back there. I like. And hopefully I'll be able to dry, like paint this a little bit quicker since I've painted it once already. Um, 
I think we've got pretty much all of our basic shapes in there. You should be able to see those all pretty, pretty well. I love how this kind of looks like a horn, this big trumpet of skins there. Okay, now I'm going to start with the shadows, and I've got my Primatox swatches here. They're really muted. I think that's, they're just really pretty. Um, I also have some just regular colors. I put my Primatex in the palette with my Paul Rubens paints, the traditional ones, because I found that they went really well together because these have kind of like that earthy texture to them as well. And uh, just that's just where I put them. Um, of course, you can use whatever else that you have. I'm going to start with the shadows. I'm going to go with this Soda Light here. Now you'll notice that on my palette, I'm just gonna bring it up here. See the full pans there with these weird looking paints? These are actually the Daniel Smith sticks. Um, and I like those because I think you get much more uh, pigment for your money in those and you can slice them up and put them into, into full and half pans. And they're all uniformly priced whereas the Daniel Smith tubes are priced um, by the series. And you know, and it, they can, you know, you can, I don't know why they do that. I think I have a feeling they might change it at some point, but um, I feel like you can get a lot more for your money when you do it that way. Yeah, now I'm going to grab some of this um, this purpley color. The ones in the half pans were from the uh, so like this, 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 and this were from the um, kind of uh, starter set or the no the six color introductory set of the Primatec pigments. You can pick it up on Amazon pretty inexpensively, under thirty dollars. Um, if you want to just try those pigments out, they granulate really well. You'll want to, if you put them in a half pan like that, you're going to want to spray them before you use them because they will, they don't soften, they don't react as well as like your traditional watercolors. So keep that in mind or just keep them in the tubes and squirt out a little bit. The sticks though, they react really well. Um, I think they've got like uh, whatever they have in them to make them hold together in stick form. It just makes them react really well. Let me get some more of that. Like this purple where it was from a tube and it dried down, it's really hard to get that color out. So I would recommend that you work right from the tube with those. Or it might damage your brush with the amount of, uh, of coaxing you need to do. But I really like the sticks. I find that they're definitely, they're not like a Caran d'Ache. You wouldn't want to color with them or draw with them because they're just kind of gummy feeling. It's like actually having a, like a pan of watercolor. So just a really, really neat, really neat product. And much cheaper if you get it in the stick form. Actually, after I found out about the sticks, I didn't, I stopped buying the Daniel Smith tubes because the sticks are so handy, especially if you like to work from a dry paint like I do. You don't have to, you don't have to squeeze them out and wait for them to dry. You can just go right to town. I'm going to take a little bit of that pink, mix that in there, because I do have some more pinky, lighter shadows I want to put in there. And I'm working at a little bit of an incline, but that's more just for, so you don't have so much glare when you're watching. But if you notice that you're getting puddles, then what I recommend you do is you dry your brush off and then you just kind of set the brush in the, um, in the puddle and soak it up. The thing I really like about these paints though is the granulation and you can kind of see, well I'll show you on my, uh, on my other painting because it's dry. So I'm just going to soak up those puddles so I don't get blooms. But if you look here, you can kind of see just that kind of texture in the wash there. From the granulation on those paints. I just think it's really pretty and works really well for this. And uh, because these paints are made of ground up rocks, they granulate really nice. And that's kind of the uh, the thing with the whole, that's the whole thing about Primatech is the, the fact they're made from, um, from minerals. I'm going to take some yellow ochre, which actually is made by iron, from iron, iron oxide. I'm going to add a little bit of this, uh, I think it's Pomonite Genuine, make a little bit of a peachy color. And I'm going to add that onto some of these clothes because I sketched in with a um, with a watercolor pencil. I don't have to worry about like having lines left over, so I'm able to like paint something pretty realistically. But I'm also able to kind of alter it as I go, and 
I don't have to, you know, worry about my lines showing. I don't have to worry about erasing. I could be really free with it. And that's really what I wanted with this piece. Um, I think it'd be really pretty to uh, hang up at the kitchen. And plus I like to paint food. I just thought that would be really, really neat. And I, you know, I love it when I'm cooking and I'm like, oh, you know, when I get inspired to paint. And if you don't, don't feel silly, if that's, if you feel that way too, you know, either snap a picture of it, say like you need to use that ingredient in your meal, you know, snap a picture of it and, you know, save the picture and just, you know, paint from the picture. Or if it's like something like this, like you've leftover, leftover ingredients, you know, take it, take it down to your art table, take it over to your art table, sit at the kitchen table and, uh, and, and play. I'm going to grab a different brush because this is such a soft brush. I want to really coax out some of that color. So I'm just going to, I'm going to grab this brush here because it's a little bit stiffer. I'm going to get some of that color out. I just didn't want to damage my, my softer brush. I could have squirted a little bit of fresh paint on top of there. Um, but I decided that I just want to kind of use that up so I can just use the fresh paint from now on. Hope you're all doing well. Um, I know some states are starting to open back up, so I hope that everybody is uh, is happy and healthy in your neck of the woods. I went down and visited my parents and my sister on Mother's Day yesterday. Well, from when I'm filming this, this will be going up a few days later. Um, it was nice. It was nice. Everybody was doing well. Nobody had been. Nobody's gotten sick. We've all been good here, but we've been staying home, which is, you know, par for the course, working from home. Kids are out of school till next fall, well, learning at home anyway. Uh, I'm going to get some texture in there. I'm just going to kind of squibbly, squibbly it around. A little bit of purple in there. I love this technique. It just is very, very freeing to paint like this. It's almost like I'm, you take an ordinary thing and you kind of abstract it. Which I know can like give some people like can freak them out a little bit, you know, to say abstract, but um, but that's kind of what it's like, you know. You're going in, you're I'm just looking at light and dark. I'm looking at values. I am pushing the values a little bit because I want to make this really interesting. I want to. That's why I'm making it much bigger. I mean, the garlic is like about this big, and I'm making it like four or five times larger. Because as an artist, you can make other people see the world the way you do, and um, and you know people might never, somebody may never have noticed how pretty a, a garlic is, and then they see your painting and they're like, "Oh, I never noticed that." You're right; that's really pretty. I'm gonna pay more attention next time, and that's what art does. It, it teaches people to to pay more attention. And you will need some darker values, but if I squint and I look at that garlic, I can see there are some darker values there. Now I'm going to grab some burnt sienna from my my Paul Rubens, and I'm going to grab a little bit of this kind of a garnety color. This brush here is a oval wash, or actually it's more of a cat's tongue because it's got that point to it. It's really handy um, because you can get so many different shapes of stroke from it and all from the same brush, you know, especially if it's well matched to the size you're working so you don't have to keep switching your brush around. You can get them from lots of different companies. This one happens to be for, uh, Roy Mac Revolution. And if you're in Australia, uh, this comes from the Micador website and um, I don't know if you can get this brand in the United States I think they might ship but it might be kind of pricey so you might want to look for a, you know just a company that carries it in your country I know Jackson's has pretty good prices on brushes I haven't ordered from them myself but I know a lot of people worldwide order from them out of the UK because their prices are better and their shipping is not too bad we get pretty spoiled in uh, the United States with what we have options for as far as our supplies and ordering. Alright, I need this to be a little bit more purpley. Get that right in there. 
don't have to have the, you don't have to do these with the uh, Daniel Smith. I just thought that would be kind of fun if you have that paint. I know a lot of people grabbed it on Amazon because they had it, you know, pretty inexpensive. I think the regular price for the six color set might be around like 50 or 60 bucks, but Amazon usually has it for under 30. So I know a lot of people have picked that up over the years just because it's, you know, it's kind of novel and it's fun and it's an inexpensive way to try some Daniel Smith colors. So I figured probably a lot of you guys out there have it. Maybe you haven't used it because their colors are not the most, um, mm, they sometimes are not, these are not the most user-friendly colors, I think. I did like a uh, lobster head in these colors, and it was perfect for that because they had, We, I, my daughter Lila had found this, like, shell, lobster head shell on the beach last year, and I did a painting of it because I just thought that was so interesting, you know, just the just the way it looked um, and it was perfect for these paints but it might you know it can be difficult to find something to use it use them for so I'm taking the yellow ochre I'm really diluting it because it's really strong and I'm going to give a little bit of wash into some of these warmer areas It's nice to have the contrast of warm and cool, that yellow and blue, yellow and purple, those are nice uh, to contrast each other. And you can also group certain areas together, like I'm grouping kind of like the some clove areas and some outer skin areas where you get a little bit of a warmer, a warmer look. I didn't use any masking fluid. Um, I'll probably just try to keep some of those white like tips unpainted. But you could always go in with a little gouache or... Um, or gel pen or colored pencil or something like that after, if you like. Now I'm going to do some pink on its own. So we used the pink mix with the yellow ochre at the first part to get that little bit of color. The palette that I'm using, by the way, um, comes empty, and it's by Meaden. And there are a couple little rails you could put in there, but when I put the Paul Rubens pans in here, they, the rails wouldn't fit because the Paul Rubens pans were a little bit big. Um, so just to let you know, if you get that, you're going to have... Um, they're going to have these little clips in there to hold your pans. But I love that I could put more down the center. I used a little poster putty to do that um, with this. In case you have this palette, I took the rails out because my Paul Rubens pans were a little too big to put the rails back in. And they used poster putty to stick those pans down the middle. You can get that at any dollar store or any office supply store. Uh, what color? Oh, yes, the pink. Let's put that on there. And try to keep your motion going with the veins on the skin. So, here, let me show you what I mean. You see, like, can you see those veins? They kind of go from the, the center out. So you'll see this, this kind of like an onion skin. You're going to see these little veins on the clothes and on the skin. So just try to keep, when you're putting your brush strokes down, keep that in mind so everything's going to... Um, going to work together. Even if you're not seeing the veins per se, it's still you're still, you know, gonna feel that, that they're there because of the way that you're painting. So if I was gonna paint someone here I would, you know, go with the the direction there. Um with the the um, the paints here, these mineral colors, their intensity varies quite a bit. They all have very different characteristics. So um, if you're used to a paint line, say like Holbein or uh, Schmincke, those both have very, or like the new Alta new set, they have very similar. All the paint consistencies are very similar. Um, with this though, you're going to have differences in texture and in strength on each color. So just kind of keep that in mind because it might be something that's a little bit new that you're not used to if you haven't, you know, used a paint that has such a diverse textures to it. Oh, my daughter is sewing upstairs. I don't know if you can hear the sewing machine. <laughs> Get these little parts in there. All right, I'm going to let this dry. It should only take a couple minutes. And when we come back, we're going to do a little bit of detail and um, go on from there. Okay, this has dried. Now I'm going to go in with some darker color. Um, I've taken some of the um, sodalite, some of the, um, I think it's hematite, and a little bit of the purple there. 
and um, just tried to just kind of make a, uh, not really a muddy, but just kind of like a, a neutralized dark. And I'm going to go in with this liner and almost draw. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the lines. I'm going to just get some of the contrast back. The thing I like about a liner is that you don't have to reload it very often and you can almost like, it's almost like you can do calligraphy with it, you know, because you could put in these nice, really expressive strokes. And this is not, um, this is definitely more of like an abstract or I think expressive would be the right, would be the right, uh, the right word for it. I just want to kind of get that kind of wild and free natural look that I really like. You know, you get all the, the skins going everywhere, and I just think it's really cool. I'm going to grab some of this blue here. Remind me to grab that, the box that these paints came in. I could show you what that looks like. Um, and I can show you the names on them, too. You know, you could use, like, a Mayan blue. That would be very close to this. Uh, you could even use an indigo, but you need to add some water to it. I just love all the undertones and I really like um, just really kind of pushing them. Although if I've got like a little bit of like loose skin, I will go underneath it to kind of shadow it and get just kind of push my brush around, get that like kind of ragged edge and then just drag down the, um, the veins. You make sure your brush is wet enough so that it will, it'll let it flow. Making sure I have contrast here. Yeah, I'm sorry about the uh, the noises. As usual, I've got the space heater cranked, uh, blowing right um, on my legs, and I and the furnace is you know on hitting the rest of the house. It's a spring that never happened in Maine this year. <laughs> oh my gosh! Actually, it was pretty pleasant walking the dog this morning, but uh, but it's still pretty cold and windy. Oh, this is a pretty color. I think it's um. Eh, you know what? We'll just have to wait. I'll go. I'll grab the container and show you. But it's kind of like a pretty garnet. It looks like it looks almost like a garnet color, doesn't it? Actually, that might be hematite because I think that that's kind of it's kind of a bloody color, and I think that's what that word comes from. It's like a bloody bloody color heme. We're really gonna have to look at that uh, that packaging. I spray my paints in between as I'm working too, just to make sure that I can get that color free. I'm just kind of cutting in here, cutting in against the overlapping skin just so I can put that shadow in and then I'm going to drag it up so I can get that veining in. It's important to use whatever you have though, especially now when like, you know, you might not be able to get an order for quite a while if you want to order something online and, you know, improvise. Artists are very good at improvising, I think. Take a little bit of that pinkier color and a little bit of that purpley color. Let's hit the edges of the skin here. Get those contours. Just drag in the lines. I love shading next to some of that rough skin because I think it just gives it such an interesting texture. It's very satisfying. these little areas here where I've, you know, pulled garlic off to use these interesting little uh, kind of like stems where the cloves are broken off. Grab a little yellow ochre. And you know, I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine and I think it's good to mix between brands because you're going to find like different brands of different colors you really like and you might find that like one set of paints you have work really good. You might have a couple like just random tubes of a certain brand and you might realize, oh, those work really well with, with this brand. You know, you mix them up, put them together so they make sense for you and the way you work. No two artists are going to have the exact same palette. You know, unless they bought a pre-made one, then, then they were the same. But for the most part, 
you know, after you've been painting for a while, you figure out what works for you. And, you know, you might not replace a color that you don't use so much, but you might buy another color again, or you might even buy, you know, a, a related color because you think it would work so well with a color that you've been, that you really like to use. So everyone's, everyone's palette's going to be a little different. Don't feel like you have to have the same as anybody else's. All right, I want to get some greens in here. I'm going to take this blue and mix it in with the yellow ochre. Rather than taking the green from the Daniel Smith set, because I haven't used that yet, but I've used these two colors, so I much rather would mix it from something I've already used. I'm seeing some like, green on that side. Uh, seeing a little bit up here. Just make sure your strokes are going with the direction of the veins on the cloves of garlic, and you're going to be all set. All right, I'm going to get a brush that's a little bit uh, less long so I can get some more detail here. And I'm going to go into that nice dark soda light. I'm going to warm it up a bit with uh, some of this reddish color. And now this is a really dark value. I can really go in and place my darkest values. I'm actually looking at my original the sketch that I showed you at the beginning of the video as much as my actual clove of garlic over there because I adapted the sketch to be able to um, kind of push those values. So there's nothing wrong with sketching something before you begin, before you sit down and do the real painting of it, especially if you're a little nervous about it. You might end up liking your sketch better, which I don't think that's a bad thing. But it can help you understand the subject a lot more before you dive in and paint. This paper is not a super white paper. This is the uh, traditional white by Fabriano. So it's actually behaving quite a bit like the gray, and I think if I did use the white gouache on here, it would, it would, it definitely would be like a shade, a shade brighter white than my paper. So that might be kind of fun to to put in there. It's easy to get lost in all the different textures and folds and shapes here. So and that's another reason the sketch comes in really handy. Just kind of helps you your bearings. It's really easy also to set this down in a different place from where you started sketching it from and then be like, oh, wait a minute, why did I draw that? I don't see that now. So having your sketch can help you there. Also getting these values in really is helpful. So I've got a darker value on the inside of this little trumpet of, of leaves. I want that little purplier too. To coax that purple out. I like to tap my brush along the edge because it helps get me it helps me get that um, that onion skin or garlic skin effect. And I'm just gonna kind of drag it out so I get a little bit of a transition, but I also get a little bit of texture. And we've got another little layer. Do the same thing up there. I don't want to overwork that. That's going to be the the challenge is not overworking this piece and keeping that freshness. Ooh, I think no. I'm going to stick with doing the the darker values. I get distracted. I want to jump ahead and do other things, but I need to finish getting these darker values.
And to be honest, I typically will spend longer on a painting if I'm not narrating a tutorial at the same time. I think it's because I just lose track of time and then I just kind of like zone out and work on it. So this one might not come out as well as my sketch because my sketch I was just kind of chilling out, not worrying about the time or how long it was taking. But I always have that in the back of my mind when I'm doing a tutorial. I think there's a, an impression that watercolor paint just happens effortlessly in no time at all and uh, sometimes it does but oftentimes there's a lot more work behind it than I'm gonna grab some blue and add that to the mix uh, oftentimes there's a lot more that goes into it than people would ever imagine it's like uh, it's like all the time that goes into a figure skater skater learning how to how to skate you know it looks so effortless and easy because they've practiced so much I feel like I've missed something there I have to look at my garlic here yeah I should have just table there but it doesn't I don't have a shadow in that area it's just light table I guess so I'll just leave it be I'm going to go in and uh, soften any of those watercolor pencil lines that I don't want dark. Just paint over them, let them dissolve. If you used a really light color, you probably don't even need to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hit a little bit of yellow ochre here and there. I don't want too much, I just want it really, really light. You can help like identifying what is garlic and what is background. So that's what I like about that because I've got that area in there that's really going to end up being just a table. Such beautiful neutrals. That warms it up. I think yellow ochre is such a pleasant color. It just really makes other colors more beautiful, I think. Okay, I'm going to take a second for that to dry. While it's drying, let me show you that uh, that paint box I was telling you about. Got it. There we go. Ah, right here. Daniel Smith Primatech starter set, our intro collection. My space heater was in the way of my drawers opening up. Um, and it's got uh, Rhodonite Genuine. That's that pink color. Let's see. That's this color right there. It's got Jadeite Genuine, which is this color. It's got Amethyst Genuine, which is that purple that doesn't want to um, dissolve, but it's also got a nice sparkle to it. I don't know if you can see it on camera. It's got a very, very subtle shimmer to it. It's really pretty. So does, the, so does that pinky, uh, the Rhodonite color. Um, this one is Pimeotite Genuine. I was thinking Hematite, but that would actually be... That one is that. That one is Hematite. The one's more... Uh, more gray looking. So the first time I said it, I was right. The second time I was wrong. I think heme, I think blood, but that pimatite definitely is the one that looks more bloody. Um, and then Mayan blue. Oh, that is Mayan blue. So no wonder I said you could use Mayan blue because it is Mayan blue. Ha, <laughs> there you go. Right? You read it here first. But this little set here, I think I paid about 24 bucks. Um, a little goes a long way. If you're curious about these paints, it's probably the most affordable way to try them out. Um, then the sticks cost $8 a stick on Blick. Somewhere on there, Blick Art Materials. I think they retail for like 13 but um, I paid about 8 I believe. And they're handy. They're nice to have. All right, for highlights, I'm going to use my Bleed Proof White. I really liked it in my sketch, um, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it in this painting as well. And because the white is going to be brighter than the natural white of the paper, I think it's going to look really nice. Um, I'm just going to use this number 2 round. And I'm going to work right from the right from the container, as long as my brush stays clean. If my brush doesn't stay clean, then I'll put a little on my palette. Um, and I am going to, between looking at my sketch and looking at 
the uh, the garlic itself. I'm just going to go kind of back and forth because I know what I did in my sketch that I liked and I do like to I do like to have a nice um, repeatable success if at all possible. Of course you don't have to do this just like with anything, if you don't like it, if you don't need it, if you painted on bright white paper and you left enough white and you like it the way it is, then leave it the way it is. Just because I'm finishing my painting like this does not mean you have to do yours like this. I do like that I can get that extra little shimmer. Sometimes I don't want it so bright, like on the uh, interior of the clove, but I do want to show the, the uh, volume. I'll liquidif liquidify it. I'll dilute it on my palette. It can look a little stark on the natural white paper, though. I will warn you, because it is, it's a, it's a cooler white, so it can look a little bit out of place. But on because because of, of gray paper, the toned gray I, I did my sketch on, is a cooler tone. The gray is cooler tone than like a beige or a or a natural white. This could look a little bit out of place. So if it bothers you, after you're done, you could you could uh, just lightly lightly wash over with a little yellow ochre, or you could add a little yellow ochre into your mix. It will take out some of the um, some of the highlighting aspects, but it you might prefer the way it looks a little bit better. It's completely up to you. I think it's important to know why things look the way they do, why things are successful and why they aren't, or, you know, why you might like one thing you, on one picture and you don't like it on another one. Like, you might have liked my sketch and you're like, eh, I don't know about this one, Lindsay. That could be why. And that way, when you're doing your painting, you can decide what technique you like and what you'd rather pass. Although I think you should really try as many techniques as you can because um, that's how you're going to, you know, when you put things into practice yourself, that's how you're going to remember how things work and that's how you're going to remember what you like. And you might not like a, a technique for a, like one painting, but then you might be doing another painting down the road and you might be like, oh, that would be perfect for this because you remember how, you know, how it looked and even if you didn't like it on a previous painting. Maybe be like, oh yeah, that will work really well on something else that I'm doing. All right, there we have it. Of course, you can boost up any of the co other colors that you want. Maybe just a little bit more pink and purple here and there if you want to. It's completely up to you. I think it's fun to kind of uh, fuss around with these paintings. Practice your brush strokes. It's it's a really good one for that because there's so many nice areas that you can put those stripey veins in. And practice working with the contours. Sometimes after you get your highlights and you realize you could use a little more contrast or you need to have a little less. I love the splashy layers, like just kind of throwing in a little bit of pink here or there. Sometimes you need to tone out some texture. You can do that with your by adding some color. You can add shadow, depth, form. Have fun with it. That's all I have for today. I will link up the supplies in the video description in case you want to find them for yourself. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I'll show you my sketch again because the sketch is dry, so it'll just give you a better idea of what those highlights are going to look when they're dry. They'll be a little bit more opaque. Um, I think this is fun. I think this would be pretty to hang up in a kitchen. It's just a good, nice vibe to it. And um, yeah, quarantine still life. There you have it. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Until next time, happy crafting.